keep the peace. Hello everyone and welcome to this week's edition of Wag the Dog FM, your public relations podcast. Every week we discuss what is happening in our profession. And this week is a bit of a special edition uh, because I'll be interviewing a podcaster about podcasting on my podcast, if you can follow what I'm saying. In fact, I've invited uh, Steve Lubetkin, also called Podcast Steve, uh, and he's the founder of Personal Podcasts, one of the first podcast production companies, which is now a division of the Lubetkin Media Company. LLC. He's also an award-winning producer of business and organizational podcast. And Steve and I, we met in 2008, I believe, at a conference in Reykjavik. And already then, Steve was there recording the sessions, putting them online. So he's a, a huge podcast fan and professional. And um, I saw that he wrote a book. He co-authored a book with Donna Papacosta of uh, Trafalgar Communications. Uh, she's the, the host of a popular uh, podcast called Trafcom News. And... Um, his book, or their book, The Business of Podcasting, How to Take Your Podcasting Passion from the Personal to the Professional, will be the focus of this edition of Wag the Dog FM. So with Steve, we're going to discuss the business of podcasting, how to apply it in public relations, in thought leadership, how this all came along, and how today podcasting, a professional podcasting, can be really part of of the arsenal of the public relations professional. So without further ado, here we go. Steve, welcome to uh, Wag the Dog FM. Philippe, thanks for having me on the uh, podcast. Yeah, it's a pleasure. I mean, we, uh, we were just speaking before we started this discussion. And we haven't spoken for a very long time. We met only once in Reykjavik of all places, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it's, it was kind of interesting. The International Association of Online Communicators. Yeah. And for the first time, they decided to have their conference in what could be arguably called Europe. And the organizer chose Reykjavik because she thought that would be sort of halfway for both uh, U.S. <laughs> participants and European participants. But she didn't realize that for Europeans, going to Reykjavik is uh, extremely expensive. The, the currency exchange was not uh, in the right direction. No, I and remember that. that. It was like, well, it's in the middle of the ocean, so it will be easy for both parties to meet. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and and it just didn't work out. There were uh, very few Europeans. I think you were one of them, and uh, Luke von Brekel was there. Yeah, and, Luke, Luke was there. It's true, yeah. Uh, so, uh, But we had a wonderful time, and uh, we really enjoyed seeing a culture that was completely different from... Uh, you know, what we're accustomed to in the U.S., you know, going to the traditional European destinations. Yeah, and, and, and I remember at the time, looking back at the time, there was at the time really a need about getting online communicators together. Absolutely. And, you know, it was the, it was the dawn of the yeah. social media era. And I think back then we called it new media. Yeah, we, we um, called it new. Yeah, it was new media. And, and I think my official title at the time was new media coordinator at IBM. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah. Yeah, and um, you know, there, were, there was not a lot of um, procedures or processes codified. We were all learning as we went. Yeah, and that, is, that was the nice part of it. You see, that's, those are the things that I'm missing and that I rediscovered with podcasting, which of course is the main theme here of, of our discussion, but that's what I'm rediscovering now, the fun of just, you know, just trying it out and, and, and things will go wrong and whatever, but just touching on those new things. Well, again, podcasting is not new, but, but at least, you know, the, the ways that we can now communicate these files and that people can access them, I think that is very new. Uh, that wasn't the case at the time, right? No, um, it, it's um, a completely different channel. And really, the, the reason I got into it was because of my passion for radio as, as a uh, young person. I was a teenager when my dad arranged for me to visit a uh, training facility. He worked at a military base in New Jersey where the uh, U.S. Army trained um, members of the military in all of the Signal Corps tools. Uh, the Signal Corps in the U.S. Army is uh, responsible for radio communications and radar and telecommunications of all kinds. And one of the things they trained them for was to actually be radio broadcasters on the Armed Forces radio network. And they had on the base a, a full-blown uh, radio studio mock-up where they trained DJs. Um, and I got to spend an afternoon there as a uh, teenager, and that was it for me. I, I, I was smitten with the radio bug, and all I wanted to do from that point on was be in radio. And I spent most of my teen years in my basement uh, play area um, with a microphone, a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder for 
listeners who are old enough to remember when we recorded sound on reels of magnetic recording tape. I, I uh, know that, Steve. I've got one. I can tell you I've got one. Uh, my dad was the same aficionado like you, and uh, I still have his, uh, his reel-to-reel recorder. It's incredible that people took those in their car, drove some couple of miles to visit <laughs> friends. At least that's what he did. He visited friends and then they had the reels and then they played music and they recorded. Crazy. Yeah. Sure. And and I have one in the in the studio with me here and just finished uh, digitizing, transferring from wow. magnetic tape to, to digital, about 150 reels of tape. <laughs> it's taken me many months. Um, and now I have the, the, the wonderful task of going through them and, and editing them. Yeah. But, uh, but I have them preserved. That's the main thing. The, you know, the 30 or 40 year old uh, recording tapes uh, eventually deteriorate. But, um, but so I spent, you know, the teens making pretend radio shows in my basement with this reel to reel tape recorder and playing them for my best friend. Um, and then flash forward, you know, 35 years and podcasting has become um, essentially the replacement for that. Uh, the difference is, and this is what Donna and I have done, is we've taken that passion and turned it into a business in a way that most of the other podcasters you'll talk to have not. The model for most podcasters tends to be, I'm going to create a brand around my show and the topics that I speak about and uh, therefore attract a following and therefore attract advertisers. And that's not the approach that Donna and I have taken. The approach we've taken is we know how to produce podcasts at a very high level of technical quality. And what we're going to do is offer that service to people who feel the need for podcasting as a communications channel for their business or organization and help them do it in a way that sounds professional. Because when I first started really listening to podcasts, and I have to credit my wife who said, you know, I heard this thing on NPR about this podcasting thing. You really have to check this out. And I, that's when I started listening to podcasts. Some of our friends, the early adopters like uh, Shell Holtz and Neville mm-hmm. Hobson, um, and I, you know, and they do a great job and there are some others who do a really great job, but the vast majority of podcasters did not. And, and what I heard was, uh, reminded me of the time I spent in college radio where it was very amateur, uh, sounding and people talked about the equipment in the studio and lots of things that people really don't care about. Mm. What they really want is your knowledge and expertise. And I said to myself, this could be a gold mine of a, uh, a tool for corporations to deliver their messages, but it has to sound like professional radio. In the United States, that would be national public radio. I guess in Europe, it would be yeah. the B- BBC or yeah. one of the other. Yeah. BBC would be the, the, you know, the level, the, at least in English, and then in Belgium, it, it would be RTBF, uh, you know, the, 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 the traditional radios, but which have top quality uh, sound, top quality interview techniques, top quality people, all these things, yeah, yeah. And so so that was the, you know, the beginning of, you know, learning. Um, I had to basically teach myself the new techniques because when I became a radio broadcaster in the U.S. in the 1970s, um, we did use magnetic recording tape and we edited uh, audio by using a razor blade on that magnetic recording yep. tape. Yeah, that was and, editing at the time, yeah. Yeah, and if you made a mistake in uh, judging where the splice should be, you, you, you messed up unless you had another copy of the audio. In digital recording, it's different. And I set about learning how to do digital recording most effectively and then accumulating the tools to do it properly. And uh, over the past 10 and a half years, I'm happy to say we've managed to create a business here. Mm-hmm. The, the, f- the first division of my, uh, what my friends jokingly refer to as my media empire, um, was called professionalpodcasts.com. And uh, that's exactly what we started producing was podcasts that were done with a professional eye, that were done in a way that um, allows the uh, the client to have the comfort level they need that that what they're getting is going to be high quality and it's going to be listenable it's not going to jar people's ears by having wild fluctuations in the volume which you hear in some podcasts yeah. it's not going to have bad audio because someone didn't take the time to record it properly that sort of thing so we have professional microphones we have professional digital recorders um, and we have professional software that we use to do the final mix downs. So, and now and there's a, there's a book then uh, together with uh, with your colleague eh, Donna Papacosta, 
That's from, right. Uh, Travelcar uh, Communications. It was funny because I, I don't know Donna, but when you send an email, um, you know, introducing ourselves, I said, you know, things cannot go wrong. My Twitter handle is Horatio Nelson, and her company is called Trafalgar Communications. So, you know, it seems like a match made it, it, in. It, uh, it should be, yeah, in history it, heaven, <laughs> if nowhere else. But so now there's a book. Uh, you're a co-author with her, the the business of podcasting, how to take your podcasting passion from the personal to the professional, and and I think that is the interesting part where. We have professional podcasting techniques and, and, and systems now, and companies and organizations can use that as a very valid uh, communication channel, right? Right, and you know, with the with the um, the media attention that podcasting is receiving in recent months, in particular because of the success in the U.S. of some of the uh, very prominent podcasts, which um, essentially are radio programs produced by uh, media outlets and then distributed using the podcasting channel. Um, it's gotten visibility again and people are m more aware of the opportunities that podcasting presents, particularly for organizations to tell their stories. And Donna approached me about a year and a half ago and said, I've got this idea, I think we should write this book together uh, because we both have taken this kind of an approach to how we do podcasting. And I uh, uh, immediately agreed, jumped on the idea with her. And we've been uh, collaborating on it and finally have got the book out the door. It's available on the Amazon Kindle. And uh, within the next couple of weeks after this podcast uh, appears, uh, it should be available in trade paperback as well. Because we, we do think that uh, people would like to have a, a hard copy of a book like this so they can make yeah. notes and things like that. But, um, you know, our approach, again, to podcasting has been um, there are professional ways to do it, and these are the things that you need to be aware of in order to do it professionally. And so we talk about things like uh, developing contracts, figuring out how much to charge, the different kinds of associated services you could provide along with podcasting. One of the things, for example, that I've found is um, we produce the audio podcast and very frequently the client or the client's team doesn't really have uh, a, a good understanding of how to integrate that with their web presence. So another piece of the consulting services that we can offer is helping them publish the podcast in a way that it's accessible to people who visit their websites mm -hmm. and their social media tools. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, both Donna and I have particular approaches to those challenges, um, and she does a lot of teaching. That's another um, ancillary service that podcasters can offer. If you're very good at producing the podcast, you can teach people how to do it, and that can be a source of revenue as well. We also talk in the book about the things that people will have to deal with as professional podcasters that they might not have thought about if they are simply doing their own podcast for their own account, as we like to say. Um, for example, um, when you are producing podcasts for a corporate client, you are in inevitably going to find yourself uh, running up against the, the dreaded review process. Uh, you, you've worked in a large company, I've worked in large companies, and the one thing that you learn is that n uh, many, many hands have to touch a piece of copy or a piece of content before it actually gets out the door and they give their approval on it. And we, we talk about how to deal with the lawyers who have to review things. Um, I, as a matter of fact, I, one of the stories that I think I told in the book is about presenting at a conference. And it was uh, in 2007, it was the Public Relations Society of America conference in Philadelphia, which is where I'm located. Uh, near Philadelphia, and um, I was presenting with one of my podcasting clients about the use of podcasts to promote a company's thought leadership. Right. And part of that thought leadership process included getting the legal department to review the podcast. And it was right at the beginning of the Twitter era. And I had just started monitoring Twitter using my uh, cell phone. And I had my cell phone on the table in front of me while we were giving the presentation. My client said something about legal review of podcasts, and someone in the audience tweeted, almost incredulously, legal review of podcasts <laughs> as if they had never thought of the idea that lawyers might need to review what you were saying. Yeah. And, um, you know, I was able, by seeing the question, I was able to address the question in the program, in the meeting. Um, but the fact of the matter is, you know, if you're going to do podcasting for 
profit, if you will. If you're producing podcasts as a service to clients, you're going to have to deal with that. And we talk about, you know, getting accustomed to the idea that someone's going to review it and how to work around some of these challenges. For example, you you kind of want to get the lawyers in on um, the review process early, particularly when it's in script form, because you certainly don't want to find yourself in a position where you've completed the audio recording, you've gone home, the people who are the subject matter experts have gone home, and then the lawyers come back and say, you have to change this, change this, fix this, delete this, and you end up having to almost re-record the entire podcast. No, and, and that is one of the things that I think a lot of people don't imagine, but because speech, of course, is very natural to us. Right. So when we, in public relations, we uh, put speech on paper, it's most of the time in the form of a backgrounder or a press release. That is, we found it very normal to be checked off by legal department. Otherwise, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't go out, as we say. Yeah. But when we talk to each other and record it and we put it somewhere publicly on a website or in the iTunes library, <laughs> then people have a, a different ID. And I'm like, no, 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 this is, you know, this is also official communications. If you use podcasting in the corporate public relations sense, then you are communicating officially. And anything that you said will and can be used, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but people tend to forget that because we are so used to talk to each other and, and it's it's a format that we find very natural, I think. No, absolutely. And I, the thing I like about podcasting and about particular, in particular audio podcasting is that it is something that people can use and get value from while they're multitasking. Um, very early in my podcasting career, people started asking me for video. And of course, we produce a lot of video now. But the reality is we don't want people trying to watch video while they're driving their cars. They might be able to do it while they're commuting on a bus or a train. But for people in their cars or people who are walking and so forth, you know, listening to audio, listening to the radio, listening to music is a very natural extension. And so listening to podcasts is something that, you know, people can do uh, pretty regularly. My uh, younger daughter is a, a photographer. She works for a, a fashion website and photographs um, fashion, you know, clothing and accessories all day. And she's listening to podcasts while she's while she's working. And that that's appropriate. She could not be photographing things while watching a video. So um, it's a very natural way for people to get information. You can get information a lot faster because people can talk faster than you can read in most yeah. cases. Yeah. And um, so we and, and also it's a storytelling medium. And one of the things that we haven't seen much of except from the mainstream media producing podcasts is people taking advantage of the storytelling capabilities of podcasting. And what I'm talking about there is the ability like in the, um, and the model that I have is the national public radio model here in the United States, the, the long form radio essay where they actually take you on location and you hear the sounds of the location while the reporter is telling yeah. the story. And you hear the uh, subject matter experts, the interview subjects in their natural habitat with the sounds, the ambient sounds around ambient them. sounds, yeah. I've, I've, I, I, now that you're talking about this, I remember one which was, to me, I, I thought it was really a, a, a good example of what you were saying. It was about people who, they've, they've got a, a name, I, are those, uh, I could be totally wrong, but Sandhog, so the people who make the tunnels in New York. Yes, right, that's right. That was incredible. To me, it was like, I saw those people when I just listened to the podcast, I had the background image, I mean, I really had images of people, and it was just by sound. It was just, you know, interviewing people, it was NPR, 100%. But what a top quality um, report that was. And it was maybe, I don't know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, but it was beautiful. Yeah. And, it, and, and they captivate you with those kind of reports. They're not easy to produce. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's the part that I think takes people by surprise when they first start doing podcasting is how much time you have to invest in the post-production process. And that's yeah. why most people tend to do the simple you know, one-on-one -on -one or one-on-many, you know, maybe three or four people on a panel, uh, interview podcasts. Those mm -hmm. are very common because they're very easy to produce. Um, but producing long-form storytelling podcasts is much more challenging. And everyone points to, you know, what I think they, co they consider the gold standard is the uh, serial the podcast yeah, okay. that yeah. uh, NPR put out about the uh, unsolved murder or the, the murder that may not have been solved. There's a young man in jail 
who was convicted of the crime, but he may not have done it. Um, and 12 episodes of that podcast, which everybody says, wow, this wonderful podcast. And what they tend to forget is that, and it's a wonderful show and it's beautifully produced, but it is produced by a national public radio affiliate. Um, it is produced in a multi-million dollar studio by a team of researchers, producers, and uh, correspondents. Um, it may have been produced on a smaller budget than other NPR shows, but it is nevertheless uh, produced by professional broadcasters who understand how to do these things and have the tools to do them effectively. Yeah, and, and the resources, a whole team behind that. I mean, there's a there's a scenarist behind, it, someone who writes a scenario. There's people who go on on. I mean, that it, that's a whole team working in in top quality um, levels of of podcasting of producing content. Yeah, and that's and that's the kind of thing that we'd like to see people you know, challenge themselves to, to try to uh, produce. You know, it's hard even for me doing this as a professional avocation and vocation to persuade clients to spend the time and the budget money mm -hmm. to do it that way. Um, sometimes we get to do it and sometimes we don't. Yeah. Uh, most of the time it's a conversation. It's about them showcasing their expertise in a conversation. And, uh, you know, most businesses, it's kind of hard to create that image like the sand hogs that you described yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because it, because most businesses are, you know, people sitting in an office and moving papers around a desk or working yeah. on a computer. Yeah, but at the same time, um, I think there's, there's uh, at least, and it's, it's rather a question, I'm not going to say what I think, but do you think that there is room uh, that, that podcasting will take its, what I think, deserved place in the tools of public relations business communicators? Do you, oh, do you see that happening? Absolutely. I think it already has. I think uh, many, many companies are using it in organizations, not just not just for-profit companies, but uh, not-for-profits. In particular, where I see a lot of uh, applicability and a lot of successful use is in the uh, healthcare sector for educational purposes. There's an enormous amount of podcasting being done, particularly here in the U.S., by um, uh, healthcare systems, you know, to educate their potential patients and their patients about the kinds of treatments that they have available, and the kinds of things that people should be doing for for good health, for preventative health. And uh, so th there's huge amounts of content there. Um, there. There is a lot of content being produced by companies that want to showcase their expertise. You know, the millennials have now entered the workforce in droves. Um, they are also, you know, a very connected generation. They also reflexively look for information online. When I give talks in front of a group with a mixed age demographic, mm -hmm. I, I often put up on the screen a, a slide with a logo that was, I don't know if this logo ever transferred to, the, uh, to Europe, but it's a yellow book with two fingers walking across it, which was the logo of the Yellow Pages, which was the yeah. business yeah. phone book yeah. uh, here in the States. And the, the logo, the, the, the tagline was, let your fingers do the walking. When you go in a room of the people under 35 in that room uh, at a presentation, most of them have never seen that logo because they've never used the Yellow Pages to find a solution to a business problem. And so... The fact is that most of those people, the only place they know to go is to a search engine. And for the most part, the only search engine that they really use to do that is Google. Mm -hmm. And so for most businesses who, you know, several decades ago, the way that you got visibility was to name your company with uh, a lot of A's in the in the name, A-A-A-A, -A -A -A, yeah. pest control. <laughs> Yeah, And that would put you in the top of the yellow pages because they alphabetized it. Um, you can't do that with Google. What you have to do with Google is create good, solid, quality, organic content. And by organic, what I mean is, um, and, and the search engine optimization camp will not like me for this, but trying to guess at how best to reach the top of a Google search and to try to do it with games like keywords and repeating words, um, you're never going to win that battle because Google has the ability to buy the services of mathematicians with PhD level educations by the boatload. Yeah. And they're buying them on a weekly basis and every week they're tweaking that algorithm in and ways changing it and yeah. you can't even imagine how they can change it. Mm -hmm. And so trying to guess at how you can game it is to me a losing battle. The, the real 
value that you add in, in the Google search is by producing good quality content on a regular basis over and over. Um, and if you do that, it does rise to the top, particularly if it's audio or video content, it gets a higher score. Mm -hmm. And so for a lot of companies um, whose customers might be lying awake at night wrestling with a business problem, you want to show up in the search results for that business problem on Google. And one of the best ways to do that is to produce podcasts in which your subject matter experts, your specialists in that problem, talk about how you solve the problem. Yeah. So, Steve, a very concrete question. And um, just in between, this is specifically for someone I have in mind called Mark. Uh, and Mark, listen, this is uh, for you. So listen very carefully now. Be awake. Um, I'll tell you the story afterwards, Steve. Okay. <laughs> But um, so imagine that someone is... Uh, in communications, corporate comms working for a company or a trade association in the Brussels bubble. You know, Brussels is next to Washington, D.C., the place where you have the most uh, journalists and lobbyists and PR people per square meter. And this organization, this PR manager, wants to start using podcasting to promote the organization. And uh, let's say it's about something that maybe some people will find boring, let's say engineering. What would be your first advice? Like, you know, don't do it, or what would be your very first advice? I, I think one of the big mistakes that people make when they think about entering any social media, particularly audio and video, is they think about it in terms of going viral. And the idea of, you know, getting millions of people to listen to it or watch it. Um, For most businesses, going viral is not the way to move the needle on the decisions people are making about purchasing the service or the product. Mm -hmm. what, what makes the difference is if they have a comfort level that you understand the problem and you have a solution that's viable. So you're not really looking for 20 million people to watch and share your podcast. You're looking for the decision makers at the companies that need your product or service. And that may be a much smaller universe. We have, I'll give you as an example, um, one of the clients we talk about in the book at length is a global insurance company that sells business to business insurance for the most part. It's, it's risks that businesses face mm -hmm. that they are insuring, uh, not the typical life, home or auto insurance yeah, that consumers would buy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, One of the types of insurance they sell is the insurance that companies need to protect themselves in the event of a, a cyber breach, a data security breach, or hackers getting into the system. In the podcast about this insurance, they don't spend a lot of time talking about the insurance policy. What the subject matter experts are talking about is some of the steps that companies should Think about taking to protect themselves, like training their employees properly, uh, creating uh, security firewalls and having a written policies about who has access to what and so forth and so on. It's really like a, a primer for getting your company better secured and better protected in the event of cyber liability breaches. And by the way, part of that overall risk management package is insurance like the ones that we sell. Of course. But, yeah. but, it's, but, but it's not about we have the lowest policy, uh, the lowest premium. It's not about we have the greatest claim service. That's not the point. The point is to educate people and help them respond to the problem. And what happens is they get about uh, several thousand downloads of that podcast explaining the risks And from the perspective of the product manager who was the, uh, the guest on the podcast, that's several thousand individual conversations he doesn't have to have with prospective customers. In the past, before podcasting, he might have to do the same conversation multiple times, even to the same person multiple yeah. times. Yeah. By having a podcast or several podcasts on the topic, he can send people to those podcasts They can listen to them at their own leisure and the convenience. And then when they're better educated and better prepared, come back and have a substantive conversation. So for an engineering company, it's a long answer to, to your question. For an engineering company, it would be identifying the target audiences that they want to reach and the problems that those audiences face from an engineering perspective. And then creating a series of podcasts that talk about those topics in ways that are helpful to that audience. Yeah. And that, that demonstrate the engineering firm's expertise in solving that problem. 
Yeah, and, yeah. I, and I would think about engineering, for instance. I know that a lot of people have this certain idea of what engineering is, but I think there's a huge opportunity to tell stories about how engineering impacts our day-to-day -day life. It's more on a, you know what I mean, it's more on the corporate kind of storytelling level. Um, and I think podcasting can really help in that area. Yeah. Absolutely. And it, it, it moves us more in the direction of what um, my friend Tom Ferensky, who used to write for the Financial Times, yeah. I don't know if you know yeah, Tom, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, Silicon Valley Watcher blog. And he's really the first person who pointed out the uh, concept that every company now is a media company. Um, and I, I'm indebted to Tom for pointing that out because it really opened my eyes to the potential for this. And that is... Telling the stories not as a public relations person within the company, but telling them as a journalist within the company. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it was uh, Don Hewitt, the executive producer of 60 Minutes many years ago, who said to the correspondents there uh, that the solution when they were struggling with uh, the coverage of some topic was four words. Tell me a story. Yeah. And and when you do that, when you look at it as a story rather than as, you know, something mechanical, a press release or a white paper or something like that, if you can identify the story and tell it in story form, it can be a very compelling way to deliver the company's message. And the more companies are able to transform their communications departments into a newsroom filled with storytelling journalists – or storytelling podcasters, the better off they're going to be in terms of reaching people. And yeah. it, it can really start a, an effective conversation and really revolutionize the way they deliver their messages. Okay, great stuff. So Steve, as a, as a final to round up question, what, what would be the, again, the audience are senior corporate communicators across Europe most of the time. And and people, I checked what uh, my audience where, where they where they listen. And again, as you said in the beginning, most people listen to Wag the Dog in the car on the way to their job or while uh, working out. Some of my fans do work out, not like myself, but uh, so they, they that's the places where they listen to it. But if you look at your European senior com corporate communicators thinking about well, maybe I can put podcasting in, in my in my arsenal of of, of tools. A final tip? I would think, you know, you can, you can start slowly. Uh, start with something modest like an interview uh, format and see where it goes from there. Check with your, check with your clients. See what, what are they interested in, what's keeping them awake at night. And see if you have some people who have expertise in that area who can talk about the challenges and talk about the solutions. Okay. Steve, thank you very much. It was great catching up with you. Uh, we have to do this more. That's fine with me, and maybe we'll do it in Europe next time. Yeah, yeah, it would be great. And uh, thanks for your time for being on the show. It was great talking to you. Thanks for your tips, and uh, hope we, uh, we can do this again soon. Thanks very much, Philippe. Appreciate it. So there you have it, dear uh, listeners. The Secrets of Business Podcasting by Steve Lebetkin. Now, please uh, go to the show notes. I've put links in there for the Amazon Kindle version of the book uh, by Donna Papa Costa and Steve. Uh, again, the book is called The Business of Podcasting, How to Take Your Podcasting Passion from the Personal to the Professional. And if you're slightly interested in podcasting for business purposes, that is one of those books that you need to have. Uh, read either the Kindle version or by now, I think the paperback version should be available as well. For next week, interesting topics and also an interesting announcement, but, you know, I'll just leave it here as a cliffhanger. Uh, if you like the show, please go to iTunes and give a review to Wag the Dog FM. Every single review counts. It, it is really a booster for myself, but it also makes it so that the show can be discovered by other public relations professionals by keeping the focus on the show on Wag the Dog FM in the iTunes directory. So important, just take a couple of seconds to click on a couple of stars and write me a review. Thank you very much. So, I hope to hear you all next week again, and until then, do the right thing. <laughs>